Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Drafting Software Patents, Lessons from Key Lighthouse Cases. I am Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP, and I want to cover a couple things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the conference by using the Q&A feature. Also, you can download a copy of the slides from the GoToWebinar panel. These and a link from to the recording from today's presentation will also be sent to you. Now, I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jean Quinn. Jean is the founder of IPWatchdog.com, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Jean was recently named one of the world's leading IP strategists by IAM for the second consecutive year. Kate Gaudry. Kate Gaudry is a partner at Kil Kilpatrick Townsend and focuses on data-driven and strategic patent prosecution. She has authored over 50 publications sharing results of generally applicable analyses. Dr. Gaudry also frequently consults with legal services companies to help avail big data, statistical, and artificial intelligent tools to prosecution professionals. She holds a JD from Harvard Law, a PhD in Computational Neurobiology from US, UCSD, and a BS in Physics from Fort Hayes State University. John White. John White is a US patent attorney and a patent lecturer. He is an adjunct law professor at the University of Virginia School of Law and also the principal lecturer author of the PLI Patent Bar Review course a course that he originally created. Since 1995, John has personally taught close to 50% of all practicing patent attorneys and patent agents how to successfully become admitted to the patent bar. John has also taught numerous US patent examiners at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. John serves as an expert witness in patent litigations and is regarded as a leading authority on patent practice and procedure. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gene. All right. Thanks a lot, Gail. I really appreciate that introduction. And thank you all for spending a portion of your Thursday with us here to talk about patents and in particular software patents today. And just a quick mention, this is going to be uh, sort of, I think, the middle webinar in what is turning out to be a series. And the first one that we did here goes back to November. Oh, I said November of 2019. Obviously, that was a typo because that hasn't happened yet. That would really be a software innovation if I could go that far uh, ahead. Artificial intelligence. Artificial yeah. intelligence, right. So it was November 29th of 2018 that program took place. And we did talk about the growing problem for artificial intelligence. And Kate joined us for that. So um, that was... Uh, all about software and artificial intelligence and, and the like. So you might want to take a look at that in the link to go and uh, view that webinar is up there. And then at the end, we'll tell you about the next webinar that's going to come up and be uh, follow up on what we talk about here today. So what I'd like to do is pause here. This is the registration text. You've all seen this hopefully in the email that I sent out telling you about the webinar. So we don't necessarily need to go through it. It sets up the problems that we all have. So uh, Kate, John, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here. Um, Kate, we'll start with you. John, I'll ask you the same question. Before we begin, uh, what is the preliminary information you'd like everybody to know um, about the topic? What, what information do you want them to, armed with as we start the discussion today? Um, so I'm trying to understand that question a little bit in terms of the conclusion or what's happened to bring us to this point maybe I'll, yeah I'll, I mean what, what, just what whatever I mean what is the key piece of information you think people need to have as we march into the conversation okay so there's been a lot of moving parts surrounding whether or not you can patent a given software invention and that's been a moving area over decades, but has had uh, a lot going on within the past five years. Um, so some of that is involving the case law, and we'll march through some of the major cases that have had some impact, and some of it is uh, 
dealing more with people and who's in charge. Um, not only who's in charge of your case, the particular examiners, who's in charge of the patent office, who's in charge of different art units. And so all of these factors melded together uh, along with what your particular case is, the, the specific technology, um, are highly influential in terms of the patentability prospect for a software invention. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. You know, the cases that we're going to talk about here today are are obviously important because you have to hit a certain sweet spot, but it, it's about people. And um, we're going to talk about that today as well. John, what, what do you want people to think about as we march forward? Well, what I want people to remember is, you know, and, and you may wonder what's John White doing on this panel. After all, it's about software. And, and Gene has told you over the years that what I know about software could fill a really small page. Uh, well, he knows more about, <laughs> oddly, about software than he does about turning on a computer, which is, right. I don't know how that works, but it does. And he gets people software patents. And the claims are amazing. I don't know how you do it, but you do it. Yeah, it's, you know, Jedi mind tricks. But the message I have for people is software is ubiquitous and becoming more so. And what I mean is things that you thought were wholly separate and apart from software aren't. Almost anything anymore <coughs> has a software aspect to it. You know, mundane things like, uh, you know, your vacuum cleaner, like your refrigerator, like your garage door opener, like your doorbell, you know, <laughs> really mundane stuff out there is getting smarter with each generation and it's the expectation it will get smarter still. So for those of you who think, well, this isn't my bailiwick, you know, I've kind of dodged this because of my uh, capacity. Well, I can assure you, you haven't. And if a person who's as mechanically inclined as myself has been obliged to learn this, you will too. You know, as they say, your time will come. Now, I think that what Kate, <coughs> Kate said is very important and that is, we can talk about CAFC cases, but until the training and the attitude penetrates into the examining core, you have to pay attention to the situation on the ground because that's the situation you find yourself in. You can advise clients with respect to trends and expectations and where the law might go, but the fact is you have an implacable examiner and potentially their implacable supervisor uh, straight in front of you. How do you handle that situation today? and yet be prepared for tomorrow. So that's uh, that's kind of the advice we want to give you. Yeah, and that's a good intro. And we're going to start with the people. And this is just so you have this and you know, the obligatory reference in these types of conversations about the Alice Mayo framework. And it is there for you to refer to if you want to. Now, since many of you may know that John's son is an examiner, when I when I quote an examiner and John is on the program, I always want to make sure that uh, I add this, and this is not John's son. So it's an anonymous examiner. Now, it's anonymous to you. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I, it's not anonymous to me. So this was not somebody who reached out to me with, you know, a fake email to tell me something. So, but I get contacted by examiners periodically, as you might imagine. And based on the latest, this was after the last round of changes were announced. The revised guidance was published in January. Um, this examiner told me that it has been made crystal clear to them that if a 101 rejection was not appropriate previously, then it cannot be made now. Okay, so that's the starting ground. So uh, they're trying to make it looser, the standard looser than what it has been. And then if you are going to, in the latest guidance is on 2A, so if you are going to say that something that is, is an abstract idea that has not been specifically enumerated in 2106 of the MPEP, you have to get the tech center's director's permission. And they have been told, or at least it's been applied very heavily, that that permission is unlikely to be forthcoming. So the abstract ideas are going to be very closely enumerated to those in 2106. And while this particular examiner said that in his art unit, and what I'll tell you is he was in the art unit in 3600, so some of the lower allowance rate art units at the patent office, he envisions that probably a lot of the uh, subject matter is still going to be winding up being 
uh, caught up as abstract under prong one, there is going to be uh, some interesting things moving forward with respect to whether or not the the second piece of the two, new 2A test, is it really practical application? Um, that's where the action is likely going to be. And we'll talk more about that later. But the last part here was, I thought, striking is there is this feeling among at least some in the examining court that there is an attempt to quote right size the number of 101 rejections and that would also be consistent with what my conversations have been with the folks at the top of the the office in the executive area of the office they they don't want all of these 101 rejections unless they are really necessary so for those of you who have been in the industry for a while you might remember director capos wanted examiners to push through 101 to get to 112. It's not the same way that it's being explained now, but it certainly feels to me like that is what's happening. Uh, Kate, John, do you have anything you want to add? Are you seeing changes or hearing things like that yourself? Kate? Yes, I've, I've seen that. Uh, so we've gotten these new guidelines now that the examiners are being trained on. What was interesting to me is that I started seeing the change before the guidelines were even issued. So when Director Iancu was initially expressing his sentiments um, that the pendulum had swung too far, Gene, you've reported on this when he was out at the AIPLA event, it, um, he had indicated that things might be changing. And just that was enough to make examiners change the way that they were examining cases. I had an interview with a an examiner and his primary, and I was going to talk about a, the 101 rejection, the 103. We got ready to speak about the 101, um, and the primary cut me off and said he, would, he thought that they'd be withdrawing that because he understood that the office was going to be changing their guidelines. Before the guidelines even came out, just the change in sentiment in terms of where that threshold was going to be that you know, the threshold was no longer going to be extremely low and everybody should push out 101, the, the threshold was going to rise up a little bit, was enough for him to say, we're just not even going to waste our time talking about this. Yeah, and that, that speech that Director Yonku gave at Georgetown in November, where he essentially laid out exactly what the Federal Register notice would then say after the first of the year, um, a lot of examiners noticed that. And what I've been told, too, is if you... If you look at some of the guidance and some of the memos that were sent out during the uh, previous regime at the patent office, they were not followed up by training. And what I'm told is um, now when these memos go out and guidance goes out, they're not only just followed up by training and PowerPoint slides, they're followed up by lunch and learns and more training and more emails and more lunch and learns. And the commissioner shows up in uh in the for those people who are on campus to answer questions and you know it is a full court pressure so that the examiners understand from the highest levels of the office they really actually mean it john are you hearing those same things uh yes and i have an anecdote almost identical with uh kate's i had a a case that was referred to me from within our firm it was under final and uh an interview had already been conducted by the primary attorney in charge of the case. And then it was turned over to me after a notice of appeal had been filed. And uh, the notion was, well, uh, let's just try one more talk with the examiner. And I was unable to pick it up until um, well after the Berkheimer guidance had come out in 2018. And all that was left in the case uh, was a 101 rejection, abstract idea. And uh, you know, it was that all these things that we're doing in the claims allegedly were uh, routine. And I asked for the interview and uh, the guy told me, oh, well, what do you want to talk about? Just that issue? Well, we're probably going to withdraw that rejection. So, you know, I didn't even have to whip out uh, Jedi mind tricks, uh, but I did make the record with the arguments and so forth, uh, the paper record. And obviously during the interview, I mentioned all these things and they said, yeah, we find that real compelling. <laughs> because yeah. <laughs> we had already decided to withdraw it. But th the other thing that I'm, I want to observe here is that uh, the PTO is one actor in our system. You have the CAFC, you have the Supreme Court, and you have the legislative uh, body. And the last time there was a split between 
the CAFC and the Patent Office particularly was with respect to the duty of disclosure. The Patent Office had one view that was very narrowly construed. The CAFC had a much, much broader view. And it took about 15 to 20 years before they came together finally right. uh, and adopted the PTO standard. And so, you know, this is not tilting at windmills that Director Ionku is doing. Uh, he is a significant actor in the system and the PTO has a big role to play, but you got to get the CAFC to buy off on it. And uh, let's hope that we can all rise up and influence the CAFC somehow in following uh, this lead being laid down by the PTO. Yeah, and in the uh, second half of the uh, show here today, we're going to spend time specifically talking about these lessons from the CAFC so we can give the CAFC what they want, because I think if we could give the CAFC what they want, we're certainly going to be giving the PTO what the PTO wants. So before we get to that, there's a couple things we want to lay the groundwork here with you. Um, the reality is, based on research done by others, and there's cited here, um, and some of you have probably heard us talk about this, this was published in the Stanford Tech Law Review um, a few years ago, almost half of all patents are granted by only 10% of examiners. And 44% um, of examiners issue more than 50 patents a year. Or, or more. So you have a, a high number of patents being issued by a small number of examiners. So when um, LexisNexis first started looking at how do you understand what examiners are doing, what they did was is they looked at uh, allowance rates, but allowance rates don't really give you a full look at what's going on because it doesn't account for the pending portfolio and it doesn't and it also kind of penalizes examiners for abandonments so what they've come up with is this ETA examiner time allocation which they think makes a lot more sense and I, I think it does too because what it does is it, it gives you this idea of what is an examiner more likely to be doing when they're working at their job? Are they more likely to be issuing uh, allowances or are they more likely to be issuing office actions that do not result in an allowance? So the green, if you're a green examiner, that means that you have a lower ratio of rejections to allowance. So you, you might only, for every uh, three office actions, one of them might be an allowance. For a red examiner, it can go much higher. You might do 10, 20 office actions before you make one allowance. And obviously in some areas, and particularly in some art units in this field, we know there are examiners who brag and they brag to our faces during interviews or even informal conversations that they haven't issued a patent since Alice and they're not going to start now. So they would be very red examiners. Um, and then, so what you would normally like to see Oh, I got some animation there. What you would normally like to see is, is sort of a bell curve, right? You would just like to see sort of a third, a third, a third. And if you look at the patent office as a whole, that's sort of what you kind of see. You see almost 30% are fast granters, a uh, little less than 25% are slow granters, and then a little less than 50% are in that yellow space in the middle where they're, you know, reasonably fast, to reasonably slow, you know? So you might see in certain art units, like with semiconductors, you'll see a lot more green. And then if you look at 3600, which is an ironic, right? It is pretty evenly distributed with a few more on the red side. Now I say it's ironic because if you look at the, the if you use patent advisor to look at your examiner statistics, you're gonna find that in 3600, they have the slowest and lowest allowance rates. And you're also gonna find they have, in some art units, the highest and fastest allowance rates, which is just bizarre. So you have to, I think, use these tools in order to know where you're at. So now I've created this slide with the help of Megan McLaughlin, who many of you know, she's usually with us on these presentations. And if I showed you this, 
and this is the distribution. Look, almost all of them are red. Could you tell me which art units these <laughs> examiners are in? And I'll give you just a, a minute if you want to type in your response and let's see how many of you guessed the right art units. Um, because I think they're, you know, I, I don't think it's too terribly d difficult to figure out what art units these examiners are probably probably from. These are individual art units, each of these groupings. Yeah, each yeah. of these groupings are individual. 16, yeah. sure. So they're very slow allowance uh, examiners. And um, and it, we have one, one guess for business methods, one guess for bio. Um, we have one guess for 3689, which is exactly one of them. Wow. Software is another guess. And and this these are all business method art units here. And the person who guessed bio, um, don't feel bad. We're going to talk about <laughs> bioinformatics on the next uh, iteration of this software trilogy specifically. And um, as Kate has done a, an article for us recently, that it's not all that pretty there either, although it's getting better, I suppose, uh, as all of this area is getting better. So as Kate reminds us, you have to know who your examiner is and are they persuadable in order to create a strategy. And Kate, I know that you work this with your clients a lot, and I'd like to stop here and give you the floor. And what, when you see this, what do you do? What do you think? What do you advise? Well, so one main reason why I'm looking at this is to see how I'm going to go into an interview. So I interview all of my office actions. But the interview goes markedly different, differently if, if you're dealing with an examiner with a 95% allowance rate versus a 5%. So in the 5% case, I, I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to come to that interview armed with every amendment that I'm willing to make. And if the examiner is not persuaded, and then you have to think about whether it's worth the money of the case, right? whether you should be abandoning it, or who else you can get involved. So can you, is there, well, from the get-go, I'd be looking at if there's a primary involved, and then is there a supervisor that you might want to talk to? And uh, do you want to take this case up on appeal? And then you can change your prosecution strategy to get to the person that's most favorable for you. You can always pull a supervisor into um, an interview if, you, if that's the uh, course of action you find to be most favorable. You can appeal, which uh, the initial appeal stages will involve the supervisor. And if that's uh, inadequate to get an allowance, then you're going to go straight up to the PTAP, right? So I'm constantly comparing who do I want to be in front of, and this is the first stage of it. So I'd go in fully armed um, with everything that I'm willing to put into the claims, all my arguments, and if the interview doesn't go well, maybe I can put it in paper, but it's usually not going to be any more persuasive than if I'm sitting there and verbally articulating it in the interview, and then I just adjust my strategy from there on out. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, you have to do that, I think, right? Because if you're looking at doing an interview with, uh, in the 2800 dealing with semiconductors, um, the ratio of green to red examiners is 10 to 1. Mm. I mean, that has to influence how you approach an interview, John. Yeah, I think these statistics are... Um, are useful? Are they controlling? You know, I don't think so, but at least you're making a more informed decision. You know, I, I guess I'm a very lucky guy. I don't run into the implacable uh, examiner very often. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, and it's, you, you do have a way with these Jedi mind tricks though. And you are, you are John White after all. I mean, you've well, taught, and I, we got to update the bio because it's got to be over 60% of all patent practitioners now, you know, and you walk into these yeah, it's interviews. 25,000, 26,000. Yeah. I mean, well, the I point, mean, you're, you're not you're, you're the rest of us mere mortals don't seem to have the luck that you have. Well, I do. I have luck. But I think that the attitude that I bring with me is that the examiner and I are on the same team, that there is an invention here. It's a question of defining it in accord with the statute. And you solicit the examiner's insight. 
into how to achieve that. It's not adversarial. It's 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 we're on the team together. Uh, we're both looking out for the public interests, and you are looking out as the representative uh, for your clients' interests. You know, and it, that attitude, I think, uh, goes a long way. Um, so let me ask you this, and I know maybe a little bit beyond what we're supposed to be talking about here. So, but since we're talking about these Jedi mind tricks, and this is about prosecution at the bottom mm -hmm. line, after all. And Kate, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, in John, the class that we teach for uh, new patent practitioners, there's a um, point in the class where you talk about doing an interview with an examiner in a case where other attorneys were unable to get this and the examiner didn't like a specific word. And, and the examiners aren't supposed to force you with language. You know, so a lot of times when you see an examiner trying to force you and say, I don't like that word, I'm going to disregard that word. The instant reaction is, examiner, you can't do that. That's not within your power to do that. And immediately it gets adversarial. And what did you tell our class that you do? And you did in that case. Well, you, you adopt the examiner's point of view. You say, you know, I agree. So let's solve just that problem. Because a single word in the claim had led to a rejection, an objection, an objection and rejection, uh, an objection to the specification, an objection to the drawings, a single word. And, you know, when an examiner has gone full court press over a single word, you don't come in and cite some nifty uh, CCPA decision, you know, from 1963 that says, I can do exactly what I want here. You know, that's, that's the unhelpful course. You say, you know what, examiner, I don't like that word either. So let's work together to get past that, and then let's talk about the art. Uh, you know, just, again, be on the team uh, with the examiner. Begin with that attitude and understand the constraints they're under, the training they receive, the you know, lack of appreciation of, of some of the issues you face in the commercial context of trying to get these patents, and uh, begin to develop a rapport. And I point that out specifically because if you go and you look at that, and we, I make this point in the class, that the word that John got the examiner to agree to in exchange for that word was far broader, far broader. And it was like, that's why I think it's Jedi mind tricks, you know? So, <laughs> um, but I, th I think that can be applicable sometimes in this situation as well. Obviously it won't be applicable in, if you're dealing with 3622, or 3689, there's going to be need to be real change probably at the speed level in those art units. But in some of these other art units, I think disarming the examiner and doing the unexpected and say, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the person who drafted that was thinking, but I don't really like that language myself. Um, what what can we do here? Uh, how about this language might be a good approach. Kate, what, what do you what do you do to break that log jam? So I agree with John that it's good to try to get on the same page as, as the examiner and try to understand where they're coming from. Uh, I, in person, interview as much as I can. Uh, frequently now, examiners are at home, so I'm on video conference, but initially just talking with them. So if I'm there, if I'm going up to the elevator, what's their personality like? Um, getting on the same page as, you know, we're both people trying to do the best job that we can. That's very helpful. And so you've started it out in a friendly manner and it's not uh, particularly adversarial. And then I start by telling him how cool the invention is um, without diving into the specifics of the, the rejection. Um, and when when an examiner is, you know, really digging in the heels, um, and, and then that's the point in time when, you know, I'm, I either have to get very creative in terms of the arguments or in terms of who I want to be talking to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some of these areas, it's, you know, it can be very, very hard. And, and sometimes things have broken up because of the log jam uh, simply by going, or the log jam has broken up simply by going in and saying Berkheimer. Um, but hmm. even that is, isn't enough in some areas. But now I want to transition in the second half of the show. It's all about the cases. And we have, here's a, a list of what, you know, I think are the important precedential cases. We're not going to be able to talk about all of them. 
I have Ultra Marshall and DDR holding on this list simply because I think you need to know both of them. They're still relevant. Uh, I think largely they cancel each other out because if you cite one, somebody else will just cite the opposite one. Um, but I think you have to know them. But we're going to start our tale here with Enfish. And I know when I, I pitched this, I said the seven lighthouse cases. And the term lighthouse is a term John came up with. So give him credit where credit is due. And I wound up putting eight of these in green because I decided to put Amdocs there because I think Amdocs is important, albeit very difficult case to decipher. There is a, one passage there I think is a bit telling uh, and has a very good lesson. So let's just begin here. And fish, pro probably a lot of these cases we don't need to go in too in depth with, but this is where it all began. This is the first really good news case you know we had ddr that sort of maybe canceled out ultramercial a little bit but it didn't really change anything and that was in 2014 and it wasn't another 18 months for uh before we had another good news case and this really kind of signaled that software can be an improvement if you describe it properly in the specification and the patents teach that there were multiple benefits to this particular design and I think that this was the first clue that the way that a lot of the drafting has been done post KSR just doesn't work if you're drafting for software. Uh, John, your thoughts on that? Yeah, this case is important because of what it reveals about the knowledge of the CAFC with respect to how computers operate. Because to say and acknowledge and understand that there can be a software or a hardware solution is uh, if you don't know computers very well, you think that they're in opposite hardware software. But this decision recognized right in its text that there's a lot of ways to solve problems on computers and one is hardware, the other is software and neither should impinge or uh, change the prospect of getting a patent that the software solution is as patentable as the hardware solution and vice versa and for those of you who are you know steeped in this you go well duh but you know th there's a lot of people who aren't steeped in this and so this realization on the part of the courts means now that's a compelling argument that can be used in the courts because they can cite to precedent as opposed to just a technical expert and so that's why I think Enfish was such a, uh, it was a relief, <laughs> actually. It was just flat out a relief to see that that could be understood at that level. Yeah, I, 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 think, I, think, I think that this was a relief case. Kate, your thoughts on Enfish? So I agree with what John said. Um, and Gene, you were talking a little bit before in terms of indicating that these cases change how you would want to draft an application. So before, the way a software application was drafted was to hold everything back. You didn't want to say too much because it could be used against you. And there is a case later down the line um, in, in this PowerPoint where that was exactly done. What I'm actually curious to get either one of your opinions on, I'll kind of turn the, the tables on you. Here and in many other cases, the the court is looking at the specification to draw out the advantages and the, the technical use, the, the computer improvements, computer-based improvements of the invention. Now, in many cases, we are given right, in transfers or cases that were written pre-KSR, pre cases where you don't have that. And I've successfully been able to nonetheless convey those technical uses, right? This is how it's improving the, com the computer, even if it's not in the spec. So I think it is good practice to include those advantages in the specification. Is it essential, though? And I don't, I don't think it's, it's absolutely necessary. I, 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 think it, I do think it is, and I don't think it eventually it will be. And we're going to get to um, the... Um, Oh, geez, the name of the case is escaping me. Let me, uh, where'd my cursor go? Here it is. Uh, let me just pop back to this here. When we're going to get to the data engine technologies case, because that's in red, and that's not so much a lighthouse case as much as it has one good point to it. Let me just see if I can find that slide here real quick and 
point to it right now and, and get that out of the way um, here because Judge Stoll wrote in the relevant parties in red, um, when considering as a whole and in light of the specification, representative claim 12. Now, I've always wondered how it is possible in the di district court litigations when they're trying to construe the claims to determine whether or not they're patent eligible. That can be done without a claim construction because we're, we're told over and over and over and over again, this is about invalidity and that it really is a defense to uh, infringement. And if it's a defense to infringement and it's about invalidity, then we have to construe the claims and the construction of the claims requires you to not only look at the specification as a whole, not only consider the claim itself, but to also consider the prosecution history. So now if we were actually doing a claim construction prior to reviewing whether or not the claims are patent eligible, then I think I would agree with you that it wouldn't necessarily need to be in the specification a, an explanation about why this is an improvement. And I don't know that I think you need a lot of explanation. I think there just needs to be something more than just the sanitary discussion of it in a clinical way. Um, but until we get to the point where the federal circuit says what they should have said all along, which is that if you're going to uh, decide these on a motion to dismiss, fine, but you have to do a claim interpretation. Because how can, in God's name, can you know if it is an abstract idea and only an abstract idea, for example, if you haven't done a claim construction? I, I don't know how you can do that. So the district courts are really only guessing. So I think that data engine may be a sign that the federal circuit is inching closer to getting ready because when the federal circuit does this, they have this way, and we've already mentioned this before with the examiners, before the, the revised guidance came out in 2019, January 2019, they had started almost seeming to apply this stuff in waiting, right? They knew what was coming. The federal circuit does the same thing. They know where they want to go. They know what's coming, and they kind of lay these breadcrumbs along the way. I wonder whether that's a breadcrumb, and we can look back maybe in six months or a year when they finally say, and maybe they'll do it in bonk, that in order to properly construe these claims, you have to do a real claim construction. Um, but until then, I, I think you got to be a little bit more explicit. What do you think, John? Uh, I think that... Uh, you know, the CAFC is is trying to stem the tide of what had become the awful uh, dismissal on the pleadings uh, without claim construction or anything of, of patent rights. You know, that's uh, perhaps the most cursory or short shrift thing that can be done to a patent is you don't even get past the threshold uh, at the courthouse. You know, the, the patent office already granted this thing, but no, uh, you know, weight is given to that. It seems that they just say, well, the law changed and the patent office made a mistake, no patent for you. And I think the CAFC is saying, hold on there, um, district court, you know, you've got to look at these things more closely and you're obliged, uh, to understand the claims in a much, much deeper way, uh, not this, uh, cursory high level stuff. And so, you know, they're, they're trying to do a couple of things here. They're trying to shore up uh, something that was just taken out patents uh, left and right at the pleading stage. And at the same time, they're trying to, uh, you know, get the PTAB to, uh, you know, do a better job understanding 101 and the examining core as well. And these are two distinct groups. District judges have no uh, background uh, in this area of law relative to the patent core and the PTAB. So, you know, different decisions to accomplish different things for different audiences, I think. Yeah. All right. But a great so, breadcrumb. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, Hansel and Gretel would love this. Yeah. So let me let me push this slide. Oh, no, that's uh, rapid litigation management. That slide, um, I didn't mean to have that there. That's not one of the ones I think is a breadcrumb but case. But it's a sad day. It's a sad day. And we're going to talk. have to talk <laughs> about this more in the next webinar on life sciences and bioinformatics, because the latest case from the CAFC last week seems to undo this and they're it's like ping pong with, with yeah life for, you, for you diagnostics folks out there look just just hold on to your seat 
you know, strap on your seatbelt. It seems to be quite the sine wave of hope and disappointment. Um, I I don't know what the CAFC, but Newman's on the on the uh, you know the descent, descent, which yeah. means it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> so so stay tuned. We'll talk about tuned, rapid yeah. litigation and and the Athena case in the next webinar. So which will be on March seventh. Um, so McCrow, this is the case I wanted to. I wanted to talk to you about for a number of reasons. Um, as you recall, this is the lip syncing case. And at the top of all of these, I have the judges and the judge in red is the judge who uh, authored the opinion. If the, there is a blue judge, that judge dissented. So here we had uh, Reina, Toronto and Stoll. And this, they found that the rules are what saved them. They had the rules and the claims and therefore it was not an abstract idea. So if you write your claim so that it references rules that are disclosed in the specification, it is not an abstract idea. Pretty, I think, bright line, sensible approach. Now, what I think we need to spend some time talking about are the claims. So the claims refer to a first set of rules, said first set of rules. Fine. So that you, you might read this decision and you might look at the claims and you might say, fine, I get it. I understand. Not so fast, my friend. That's right. Let's go look, shall we? Let's go to the actual patent and look and see how they define a first set of rules. And I did this again for the course that John and I are teaching new practitioners. And I was using this case because we try and use cases and patents that are vetted to show them how they should do it. And what I wound up doing is using this patent as an example of how you almost should do it. Because when you actually go and look at the specification, there is nowhere in the specification mentioned a first set of rules. There are all kinds. There's literally of every rules. other rules. There, there are secondary rules. Which implies first rules. There are post-processing rules. There, there are, are de default rules. There are auxiliary rules. <laughs> there are a set of rules, which <laughs> maybe they're first rules. Who knows? There are corresponding rules. There are transition rules. There are every kind of rule that you could possibly imagine. But no. But no first, first. set of rules. So I suppose there's two lessons here. One is... You need to, when you're reading these cases, go and actually read the patents and read the specifications. Um, so this case stands for the proposition, like I said, if your rules are in the claims, you're fine. Um, but do what the case says to do and be careful not to just follow the patent blindly. Second um, is, and this also comes up with Finjan, is if the panel believes that what you've done is an innovation with, uh, and particularly a remarkable innovation in this case, and then also in the Finjan case, where they said it was pioneering, which we'll get to, um, you're in a much, much better position. But that shouldn't mean you don't do good drafting. And this is a, you know, LexisNexis has a tool, it's called Patent Optimizer. It's, you can check to make sure that everything in the specification matches with everything in the claims and vice versa. And you know, you know, whatever you're gonna file these things, you wanna do that. And I don't have a slide that says this, you've probably all seen this slide whenever I talk about prosecution specifically. Examiners, and every examiner I ever talked to has said, they hate issuing 112 rejections because it's a waste of time. Now this could have been a 112 rejection. And today I gotta tell you it would be because they seem to have software at the office where they just, kick out all these 112s so they can match the claims with the specification. So if they've got software that does that, we should have software that we use that helps us get past it. Because how do you send to your client an office action where the first 10, 15 pages are 112 rejections? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, Kate, what are your thoughts on Macro? I mean, I thought this was a really important case. Well, yes, it was, and it came at a helpful time for practitioners. I thought it was interesting the way the court framed it. So it was all about a 
we spent a significant amount of time with analyzing what the prior art was, right, and how to determine um, the existing techniques of determining how to animate a face for existing um, sounds, right? And then in its final in, in, in its assessment of it, and, and then it said that the technique improved the um, the computer, the computer process by um, having more realistic sounds. I, w I was intrigued with this case because McRow initially had argued that they were producing a tangible result of the video. Um, that seems interesting to me because it's a, it's a digital result. Um, there was a, I believe this was the case where there was a lot of emphasis on preemption. Was this the, the correct one? So I felt like generally that the court bounced around with the arguments that it analyzed and the assessment that it made. It was favorable for us. Um, but honestly, I, I was a bit surprised with the logic that was applied throughout that case. Yeah. Um, I thought it was important simply because if this wound up, you know, from, from a fact-based perspective, if this wound up being ineligible, then I don't know what was going to be eligible because this obviously was not something that could be coded up by a second year engineering student over a weekend. You know, this yeah, is yeah, real, that, really and, impressive. You know, and whomever it is that next argues a software case at the Supreme Court, I need to want them left alone in a room with a grad student drunk over a weekend coding something and just see what they come up with. Right. You know, yeah, nothing. So, so um, <laughs> But that wasn't the argument that were, or that wasn't the analysis that was made by the court, right? Well, that was the question they, that they asked during the during the um, oral argument in Alice. They asked it twice, and the answer given mm -hmm. twice was that it could be coded up over a weekend. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the point being that this is just not Trivial. sufficiently innovative. It's not worthy so, of a patent. So, but now you know, I'm kind of starting to use that against because I'm twisting that around. So in the last article I wrote about this, about the federal circuit not really, I think, standing up and doing the right thing and, and analyzing these cases properly and deferring to the Supreme Court and saying, well, we, we have to do this, is, is that, well, you know, the Supreme Court dealt with a, a technology in Alice where they were told that it could be coded up over a weekend. So therefore, the software mm -hmm. there was trivial. You know, right. nothing can be coded up over a weekend. You know, yeah. so it probably doesn't have any real relevance for anything. But um, we have a question. Wouldn't you agree that Atrix makes it less necessary to include a problem solution in the specification since they relied on extrinsic evidence? And I would agree that that's probably, you know, that's true. Uh, you know, now having said that, what I don't want to encourage or anybody to think that what I'm saying is you want to set up a problem solution statement. Uh, you want to do this, I think, in in and you, I would never do it in the background. I, I think you want it to come through in the writing that what you have is a solution to the problem. Yeah. And, the, and the reason that I suggest that is because, let's see, is it the next slide that I have here? I think it is. In Amdocs, that's what we they seem to have done, and this is why I added this to the list late as a lighthouse case. They don't use the typical Alice Mayo framework in any coherent way, I guess, is the best way to describe it. But what they clearly talk about is that the patent claims were eligible because they entailed an unconventional technological solution to a technology problem. Now, that clearly, you know, unmistakably harkens to the European standard where there is a technical solution and a technical problem. Now, I don't think you would do it like in a uh, you college essay kind of way where you define the technical solution and define the technical problem. But I do think you would probably want the reader to come out of reading the application knowing that they're, hey, this is pretty cool because it's it solved a, a problem. You know, and I think like in the Macro case, you can understand what the problem is, is you want to be able to have people read uh, cartoon characters, re read their lips. Um, and for people who can't hear, that is a really uh, revolutionary type of invention. So there's a lot of ways that you can explain it without, I think, 
doing damage to yourself. And I don't think it needs to be a huge explanation. And I, so I don't think you need to run into KSR problems done properly. Um, but I think there needs to be something that's there. And I think the problem that we got into was very too clinically describing things such that if somebody wasn't familiar with the innovation before they read the patent, they weren't going to know what really was the innovation after they read the patent. And I think that type of claiming is the problem. Um, so, um, all right. So that's the only reason I have Amdocs here. So Thales Vision X, we can probably quickly go through that because we're running out of time here. This was uh, frame of reference, fighter jet pilots, another extremely innovative invention, you know, uh, intercepting missiles and being fired with guidance systems to avoid things and multiple different changing frames of reference throughout. And um, the claims here were, were pretty pretty lean lean you might say <laughs> and uh a different panel it, it, that's probably about the best panel you could get i mean maybe i mean there's probably you know maybe more chen and newman would be the best panel or maybe any any three of more yeah chen uh newman and o'malley would be the best but wallach and Stoller are, are clearly on the clearly that, runners up runners up <laughs> um if you had gotten you know dyke mayor and anybody else you could easily envision this case having gone the other way right but this is one of those cases where clearly there was an innovation there i think that the federal circuit found undeniable and when you see that in case after case the the outcome is it's eligible so i do think you have to be able to tell the story that this is an innovation and where that becomes most clearly the lesson i think is in finjan where Judge Dyke authored the opinion, and Judge Dyke is, as we all know, or I think we all know, I'll say, so we remove all doubts, so we're all on the same page, is clearly on the wing of the court that is most likely to find things ineligible. That's just his philosophical view. I'm not gonna say it's bad or good or whatever, but looking at his body of work, that tends to be where he falls. Um, but he wrote that Finjan uh, pioneered this type of virus scanning technique. So um, what I think you need to do when you are drafting is, is you need to make it clear that what your client has is something that is innovative, something that is cool, something that is yeah. unique. John. Yeah, I, I think... The, the problem after KSR is we're, we're kind of afraid of our own shadow, the shadow being uh, uh, the revealing the solution to the problem. And so the KSR solution is to fog it up and don't really uh, spell things out. And I, I think, you know, that's a mistake in that the people you're writing for are not fellow patent attorneys or even examiners. You're writing for judges and juries to understand what it is you've done and why it is such an innovation and why it matters. I don't shy away from it, um, uh, you know, because I want to be helpful. I want the, the, the people who are deciding the outcome to understand where this is coming from. And I think uh, you'll see that in the 101 approach that you got to define something that uh, clearly does something concrete, tangible, you know, we, we hearken back to State Street. Um, so, and we have a question here, why wouldn't you want to expressly state the problem? And I, I think the reason that you don't want to, at least I wouldn't want to too expressly state the, pro the, the problem is simply because the better you state the problem, the more likely you are to have the examiner say that, well, what you came up with was the next logical step and therefore obvious. So the better you describe the problem you're trying to solve, the higher the risk is that the examiner will be able to use your own words in the specification against you. Because remember, in the Berkheimer memo, that which is in your specification is the first option for the examiner to rely on. So you want to do it in a way that doesn't create a KSR obviousness problem. And also, 
because obviousness in 103, 101, um, 103 obviousness and 101 eligibility are really an interwoven uh, inquiry since Alice and Mayo, those concerns apply under both for Berkheimer option one, I think, and under KSR. But let's just quickly look at the claim in FinGen because if you look at this, <laughs> there's nothing really here. Again, but a lean claim, now, as they say. Recall, just so you know and remember, the litigators will tell you you can't read into the claim, and that's like half the story at best and wrong, really. You can't impermissibly read into the claim. If the claim has a term that's defined in the specification, the specification is supposed to be the dictionary. So downloadable is in, defined. Inspector. In, in, uh, it's inspector is defined. So this is a good example of a vetted claim that uses the specification and the claims together. So we're really pushing time. And the next case here is Berkheimer. And we've talked about this, you know, sort of ad nauseum. Let me move past that. We did talk about this one. And I want to get to Anchor real quickly. And Kate, I think that this sort of goes back to reminding us that it really is all about concrete and tangible descriptions. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so in addition to the discussion that we were having before about um, defining the problem, it's really defining the solution. And so I think that is one issue that I see frequently is that either because of the state of the invention that state of the invention at the time when it's being patented, or because of drafting issues, the complexity that was there that could have been there underlying the invention isn't well described in the specification. Right, so that's a whole nother uh, area, or maybe even the claims where if you just have this is the general problem and this is the end result, but really without stepping through why the particular features of the invention um, were complicated and perhaps not so obvious. And I think that's generally doing you a, a big disservice. John, what are your thoughts about, about this? I know you and I have had long conversations since you know we travel so much for the patent bar review. We've had long conversations about the meaning of State Street. And I read this and I'm like, it's not <laughs> dead, it's not dead. Yeah, State Street, I uh, understand, was uh, you know, one of the last best decisions written by Judge Rich, who perhaps more than anyone at the CAFC truly understood a, a, what the compass heading of the court was and should be and, and that sort of thing. And so State Street uh, said that if something is... Uh, possible after the software is implemented that wasn't before. You know, something is now done, it wasn't done before. That's a concrete, tangible outcome. And as long as that's present, then eligibility is present. And it, it's that simple. And, you know, you just have to characterize it uh, in the context of what the software is doing. Because, you know, a lot of times that's the distinction, you know, we could have done this with hardware, but we did it with software and it's equally tangible both ways. And I think, you know, that's a, a, again, a case that um, shouldn't be overlooked. I know that uh, people say, well, we're well past it now. Actually, I think we're returning to it uh, as, um, you know, in terms of a touchstone for 101. That's my view of State Street anyway. Yeah, I, I think we're returning to, to State Street um, and focusing on the the two middle components, the concrete and ta tangible description of an innovation. And uh, we're, we're pushing up against the hour, and I want to give both you and Kate a chance to to uh, give your final thoughts. I'll give my final thought right, right here, because my final thought is, from a drafting perspective, if you look at all of these cases, I think what you see is they're either the specification is solid and very clearly describes an innovation that then is captured in the claims, which is the way that you should do it, or the court has kind of accommodated 
to allow protection for an innovation that they just couldn't imagine would not be protectable. In uh, Talus, where it is the fighter pilots in the changing frame of reference, uh, very complicated, or Macro, where it is something that is dealing with lip syncing and just n extremely non-trivial. And there's a lot of rules that go into making that actually happen. And then even with FinGen, the claims are pretty, pretty meager, right? But they they do pull in from the spec. But it's clear that there's an invention there that they pioneered. So you want to do it right, obviously. You want to file a thick spec with a lot of technical description, and you want the claims to actually capture that. But to the extent that in the spec you can also make it clear that this is really, truly unique and innovative and cool and exciting, I think you're going to really serve your clients well. John, your final thoughts, and then Kate, I'll let you wrap up and maybe tell us a bit about what you want to accomplish in the next webinar. So what tangible advice can you provide to your clients uh, with respect to two things, the likely success in enforceability and the likely success of getting through the patent office? Well, getting through the patent office is easy enough. You, you look at what the patent office is requiring, you look at patents that are issuing through the art units, and you ape those, you know, copy the success of others or imitate the success of others. With respect to enforcement, I think you have to uh, decide by uh, looking at the patents uh, that you want to enforce or proposing to enforce license, et cetera. Wh what are yours most like? Are they like the ones that succeeded in the Lighthouse cases or aren't they? And and that's how you uh, you give advice from programs like this, you know, do a comparison uh, and take it from there. Kate, your final thoughts and maybe a quick preview for March 7th. Certainly. So my final thoughts are it's very important to tell a story. And you need to tell the story either through your specification or in an interview or throughout prosecution history. If you start out by setting the, the tone for the story in the specification, if you have all that information, that's your best bet. Um, if not, then you need to convey the complications and the ingenuity. Uh, throughout your prosecution um, in interviews and in amendments. And at that stage, that's also when it's important to identify who's going to be most receptive um, to that type of analysis. Now, we, as we indicated, there's a lot of changes at the patent office that will influence who you want to be talking to. Um, and that does go into what we're going to be talking about on the next uh, webinar with Jean and John about bioinformatics, and so this is our unit 1631. It's a technology that's really taking off um, a lot of interest, both from tech companies and from traditional biotech companies. Um, and they were hit hard by Alice five years ago, even though it wasn't talked about very much. That's changing, and so we're going to dig into what's happening with the prosecution uh, of these types of applications. And how do you best draft applications, best prosecute applications in this uh, new and emerging area? All right. Well, thank you very much, um, everybody, for joining us here today. I uh, really appreciate you all uh, being here. If you have any more information about uh, any of the offerings from LexisNexis IP, please reach out to Morgan. And I would appreciate it if you find yourself in need of any of their services to please give them a test drive and ask for a demo. They have been a great sponsor of ours, one of our top sponsors for a number of years, and they make bringing these webinars to you possible. So thank you for, the, uh, for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a good rest of your day, and we will see you soon.